thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, we will, you know, go through anal rectal malformations, which I think is a actually fascinating and complex topic. Um, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the different types because that really dictates, you know, what happens for these patients, both in surgery and then long term. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the surgeries, and then we'll talk uh, at the end about, you know, what happens to these patients after their surgical corrections um, and where to go if you see them in your practice. Um, I have no financial disclosures. I will say that any good talk on anorectal malformations has to show a lot of pictures of the genitalia and the anus. So if you are at a computer that is in a uh, public location or you have your kids running around, uh, <laughs> be aware that those, those pictures are coming. I'll warn you again before we get to them. So the objectives today, we're gonna identify the types of anorectal malformations, We'll name the main goals of surgical repair, and then we'll work on understanding the long-term prognosis and treatment for these patients. And as just a quick overview, you know, we'll go through some history, embryology, epidemiology, then we'll really get into those classifications and, like I said, the surgery and the long-term prognosis and care. Um, so no surgical talk is uh, allowed without at least one old white guy picture. Um, so we have um, Dr. Amuset, who was uh, a surgeon in the United Kingdom back in the early 1800s, who's credited with the first anoplasty, the first attempt to correct this surgically back in 1835. But really, even centuries before that, um, this problem had been described, but you know, very little was said about it, um, leading most of us to believe that this was going untreated, so some kids with, you know, potentially perineal fistulas were able to kind of eke along if the uh, if the opening didn't get strictured down and cause obstruction. But most of these kids uh, probably passed away very early on from um, from obstruction. But the current treatment of uh, Anorectal malformations was really revolutionized uh, by Dr. Alberto Pena, who is a surgeon from Mexico, uh, came to train up in the U.S., and then has, you know, really been not only developed the PSARP, the posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, that you know has changed the way um, we do surgery for these patients and the outcomes for these patients, but um, has really campaigned around the world to bring this technique to everyone so that you know, every child has an opportunity uh, to get a procedure that gives them their best shot at continence down the road. Um, a little embryology. So the urogenital sinus and the hindgut come together in the early development um, and form the cloaca, which, um, as we'll talk about later, is really just a term that describes the, you know, common channel for uh, stool and urine. Um, it's a structure that, you know, some animals can keep through out life, but about seven weeks into um, gestation, the urorectal fold comes down and divides uh, the cloaca into the urogenital sinus uh, anteriorly and then the rectal canal inferiorly. Um, the ectoderm actually covers over these openings, which later recannulize. Um, and the thought is that in anorectal malformation, this separation with the urorectal fold just never occurs. Although um, the studies that we have on this aren't very good and it continues to be an area of debate. And then finally, before we get to classifications, a little epidemiology um, in the classic congenital disease um, numbers. If you guess about one to four and five thousand for a congenital anomaly, you're probably pretty close. And that is exactly what anorectal malformations are. There may be a slight male predominance, uh, although not particularly strong. 
And then, um, although there is some genetic component uh, that is not well understood when uh, counseling parents, you know, we usually say if they have a child with an anorectal malformation, the chance of them having a second child with an ARM is about 1%. Uh, there are certainly associations, everyone will be familiar with the Vactoral Association, uh, which obviously anorectal malformation plays prominently in. Um, there is a association with trisomy 21 with imperforate anus with no fistula, which um, we'll see is a, except among this population is very uncommon. Um, and then there are, have been some associations identified with IBS, maternal diabetes, and thalidomide use. So now getting into the classifications of these uh, anorectal malformations. Um, certainly one way to look at them that is important is, you know, how they divide up between males and females. Both males and females can have perineal fistulas, they can both have rectal atresias, and they can both have imperforate anus without a fistula. In males, the structure just anterior to the rectum is the urethra and bladder. And so when a male has a anorectal malformation, it tends to fistulize to these structures, either the urethra, which we divide into the bulbar urethra or the membranous urethra that's distal to the um, prostate, and then the prostatic urethra, which is more proximal. And then you can also have a rectovesicular fistula uh, or a bladder neck fistula where the rectum actually attaches directly to the um, lower part of the bladder. And finally, you can have, although very rare, you can have an H-type fistula where the anus is actually normally placed, um, but there is a connection to the urethra. In females, uh, we most commonly see a rectovestibular fistula, which is um, an opening that occurs, you know, just posterior to the vagina. Very rarely, we'll actually see it connect to the vagina in a rectovaginal fistula. And then um, we will also see cloacas where the urethra, vagina, and rectum continue to have a common channel um, that brings up a whole nother set of issues. And you can also have some more complex uh, malformations. So looking at these um, classifications, you know, with some incidents next to them, so you can kind of understand which types are most common, you can see that for males, it's really the rectourethral fistulas that are split pretty evenly between bulbar and prostatic. Um, so that's the vast majority of them, 70%. Um, and then bladder neck fistulas are about 10%. Perineal fistulas are about 10%. And the remaining fistula types are about 10%. For females, you can see that the overwhelming majority are rectovestibular fistulas. Um, so, again, about 70% are that type, with about 20% being uh, perineal fistulas, and then 5% or less are um, true and perforate anus or uh, cloacas. We're going to go through some pictures. I think these are very illustrative to kind of understand, you know, exactly what the anatomy is. And then it makes a lot more sense, you know, what we do to treat these. So um, probably the simplest type is the rectoperineal fistula. You can see um, you can see here just posterior to where the rectum comes out. This is the sphincter complex, which is where the rectum should be and where the anal opening should be. So in the male, this fistula has occurred just anterior to the sphincter complex, um, although obviously it can occur kind of anywhere along the uh, perineum from the sphincter complex all the way to the scrotum. And you also see, I think it's you know important to note that Oftentimes, even when there is a perineal fistula, uh, 
the there is a close association between the wall of the rectum and the urethra, which uh, is important during surgery to realize. And then in females, again, we have the sphincter complex, and just anterior to that, we have our perineal opening, our rectoperineal fistula. And in this case, obviously, the vagina is going to be in between the rectum and the urethra, so we are better protected from damaging the urethra. It makes it essentially impossible to damage the urethra um, during these procedures in a female. Now, looking at some male urethral fistulas, we have the rectobulbar fistula. So, um, you know, here is the bladder, here is the prostatic urethra, and then after it makes that turn, you get the bulbar urethra, the membranous urethra, and so this on the outside is going to look like an imperforate anus, but in fact, it's a, rectu or a recto urethral fistula. And these patients, you know, may present with UTIs or stool from the penis, but oftentimes the opening is small enough that you won't necessarily see that before um, surgery is done to divert the stool stream. Very similarly, another rectourethral fistula, the rectoprostatic fistula here, the fistula is just higher up on the prostatic part of the urethra. And then a bladder neck fistula where now we see the fistula coming into the bladder itself. These will oftentimes be a little bit larger um, and can have um, stool coming out of the urethra more often. And here we have a um, colostogram where after this patient has uh, been diverted, they are instilling contrast down the distal part of the colon, fills up the rectum, and then we can see the connection to the bladder neck, and obviously it fills up the entire bladder, and you can see the bladder even emptying into the urethra. But all this contrast is coming in through the mucous fistula. And then finally, you can have an imperforate anus with no fistula. Like we talked about, this is rare, um, but does occur. And again, even though there is no fistula to the urethra, as we can see in this picture, it doesn't mean there that the um, rectum is distant from the urethra, so injury is still possible during that surgery. All right, switching to female anatomy now, um, we've got the recto-vestibular fistula. Again, the anal sphincter complex is here, and now... Um, you know, very similar really to a perineal fistula, but a little more anterior where it's actually in uh, the vestibule just posterior to the vaginal opening. And this is commonly, you know, you'll get a call from residents all the time telling you that they've got a vaginal fistula uh, and is what they almost always mean is a rectovestibular fistula. And then a cloaca, um, on the left side here, you see a short channel cloaca. Here, the rectum, the vagina, and the urethra are opening into a single common channel. Uh, but from the exterior is all you would see is just that single opening. And then on the right, um, similarly, a cloaca, but here has a longer common channel. And then finally, a cloaca with hydrocopus. This is one of the main complications that we see uh, with a cloaca that is not, um, this can you know, present this way very early, or if it's not recognized, um, can develop where you have, uh, and these um, fluid collections can become enormous um, and sometimes have to be drained through the abdomen. All right, so, sorry. Here is the uh, part of our talk that we're gonna get to some more explicit pictures, so be warned. <laughs> 
Um, so when examining these kids, particularly when trying to examine females, um, you know, another common teaching point for residents is they'll tell you, oh yeah, they have a, a perineal fistula. And the immediate question you wanna ask is, you know, did you look into the vagina, into the urethra, did you identify three openings? Um, and the way to do that is exactly what is being demonstrated in this picture, where you grab the labia majora and pull not so much out, um, away from each other, but really out towards you um, to create better visualization. And so here you can see a tiny opening for the urethra, a normal vaginal opening, but instead of the anus being placed in the sphincter complex, this looks to be a perineal fistula in a female. On the left side here, we have a male who right at the base of the scrotum has some stool and a small opening so that is a perineal fistula in a male. And here, this opening obviously is very difficult to see to the point they needed to use an instrument to cannulate it so you could really see it, but you see a vestibular fistula in a female. Now on this one, the anterior aspect is at the bottom of the screen, so posteriorly, um, is at the top, we see a very flat bottom. And this is actually a kind of a subtype of a vestibular fistula. This is called a fourchette fistula, where the fistula is right at the edge of the vestibule, so that the posterior aspect is actually normal epithelialized skin, like a perineal fistula, but the anterior aspect is um, is the more mucus, mucosa type. Um, epithelium of the vestibule. And then on the right side, you see a true vaginal fistula, which again is extremely uncommon. Um, and I would, you know, question anybody who said they found a vaginal fistula, but this one you can see the fistula actually opening inside the vagina. And then this again is a you know very classic recto vestibular fistula at the very posterior aspect of the vestibule. So this is one that we will see occasionally. Here you have what looks like a very normal anal opening. You've got a sphincter complex there, but Obviously, it is right next to the vestibule, very anteriorly displaced. And um, we will occasionally get called, you know, usually not about one this extreme, but where the team is concerned about an anteriorly displaced anus. Um, and although it clearly is anteriorly displaced, this is not an anorectal malformation. And there's nothing surgically to do about this. Um, you know, we can't, we can move the rectum into the anal complex, anal sphincter complex, but in this case, the rectum is in the sphincter complex and we can't make that any better. So, you know, every once in a while you'll get this call and a resident will have already gone to talk to the family and explained all the surgical things that are going to need to happen. And then you have to kind of talk them down that, oh no, this sphincter, uh, this rectum opens right in the sphincter. This is the, you know, the best chance that they have at good bowel control and continence. All right, a couple of, a um, couple more images of male anorectal malformations. These you will see typically with um, lower imperforate anuses without fistulas or perineal fistulas that you'll see a bucket handle or you'll see beading of stool or meconium uh, in the median raffae and sometimes it'll go, you know, partway up the scrotum. 
as well. And then the last images I want to show are cloaca. So on the left side, we see, you know, again, pulling on the labia majora, seeing inside the vestibule, and here there is only a single opening indi indicating a cloaca. Um, again, we have the image of that at the bottom here. And then it took me a long time, you know, you hear the term cloacal extrophy, and I assumed for a long time that it was very similar to a cloaca, but as you can see on the right side here, it is very different from a cloaca. So <laughs> if you hear that somebody has cloacal extrophy, um, you know, realize that that is a very different disease process, although on the spectrum of anorectal malformations is obviously a much more complex problem. Here, <clears throat> here you have the emphalocele labeled as O. You have two hemi bladders, so urine, um, the urethral openings will be down here somewhere. Um, and then you've got the cecal plate, which is an area of cecum with a prolapsed ileum, and then two bifid fallacies um, down here at the bottom. So uh, we are not going to talk about cloacal extrophy. It is a fascinating topic that you spend an hour on by itself, uh, but it is extremely rare. Um, I bring it up more to make the point that cloacal extrophy is a very different process. So not to be confused with just a cloaca. All right. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. Uh, no more pictures for a while. Um, and we'll talk about the surgeries that we offer these children. Um, so as an overview of the ones we'll talk about, um, a lot of these kids get colostomies uh, temporarily. We then usually will perform a PSARP, posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, plus or minus a laparoscopy or laparotomy, depending on how high or low the malformation is. Um, we're not really going to talk about urogenital sinus mobilization, but um, that is something that is done for cloacas or a common urogenital sinus. Um, and then we'll talk very briefly about perineal reconstructions um, in children who usually with cloacas have uh, such a small vaginal um, tract or canal uh, that it, they need it to be um, augmented. So we are back to our classifications. Again, like we talked about, um, the treatment and prognosis for these kids is very much based on what they present with, what type of uh, fistula it is. So, as we can see in this slide, all of our highlighted fistulas are going to require a colostomy. Um, if there is no fistula and a true and perforate anus, or really all of the urethral or bladder neck fistulas in boys, and so you can see that in boys, <clears throat> 85 to 90% of these kids are going to end up with a colostomy. Um, the only ones that aren't are, you know, children who have a perineal fistula that can be dilated and um, they can avoid any obstruction through just dilation of the fistula until they're ready for surgery. On the other hand, for females, you know, the vast majority of them can avoid a colostomy. Um, it's really, again, only the um, true and perforate anuses and the cloacas that end up needing a colostomy. And, you know, anybody with an opening either to the perineum or to um, the vestibule can avoid that. So, talking about the goals of surgery, you know, the big one, and I think, you know, 
this seems a little silly because most of the time we catch this very early. The kid hasn't really demonstrated bowel obstruction. He's not, you know, big and distended. Um, but if it is missed, if you are in a different part of the world that doesn't have the same access to medical care that we do, or in some cases, if um, a child is on a lot of positive pressure ventilation because they have other things going on, then you know it quickly becomes evident how big a problem bowel obstruction can be. So most of the time in these children, you know, this gets immediately identified. Um, the surgery team is called the same day, and the following day, you know, we'll bring up a colostomy if needed, or we'll dilate the fistula to make sure that stool is able to evacuate normally. As long as that is, uh, as long as stool is able to evacuate, then you don't have this issue of obstruction. But in kids, you know, males with anything but a perineal fistula, um, or females who don't have um, a way to evacuate the stool, obviously it only takes 24 to 48 hours um, for their intestines to be, you know, working stool through the system and causing obstruction. Um, I have seen this happen with positive pressure ventilation that was not recognized. And, you know, you can get into a vicious cycle where the plan is to do the colostomy in the morning. The kid is needing more pressure, so they amp up the positive pressure ventilation. Um, that is putting more gas into the abdomen. The abdomen is getting more distended, pressing up on the lungs. Now they need more pressure to overcome the abdominal distension, and you get in a vicious cycle. Um, and you know the bowel can get so distended that it necroses by the time you know you get to the OR. And then um, I have also seen this in other areas of the world where you know getting to a medical center that has a surgeon, um, really any surgeon, not even a pediatric surgeon, can take days. And if it's not recognized immediately or the trip takes too long, you know, by the time the child arrives, bringing up an ostomy becomes an emergent procedure because the child is septic with bowel obstruction and bowel necrosis. So fortunately for us, that doesn't tend to be the main um, concern that we discuss when talking with parents, but it is good to remember that you know, this is a disease that is often fatal if not treated early uh, to avoid bowel obstruction. Usually when we talk to parents, though, we are talking mostly about the opportunity for continence long term. Um, so the goal of the surgery is to get the rectum into the middle of the sphincter complex so that the child can have a chance at continence. Uh, we also want to avoid stenosis. Um, either from a fistula that gets inflamed and keeps trying to scar down, or after the surgery from um, a sphincter complex that tries to scar down. And so this becomes one of the difficulties of, you know, getting stenosis, constipation, and then, you know, a potential obstruction or partial obstruction um, when the opening is not working appropriately. Um, obviously, for males, you don't want stool going into the urinary tract. Um, that is a recipe for UTIs uh, and urosepsis. And then in females, if the uterus and vagina are not able to drain appropriately, um, that can be a problem, particularly um, once menstruation begins. So the colostomy. This is done, uh, like I said, mostly for male patients who have no way for the stool to get out. Uh, these patients are taken to the OR. The proximal colostomy is brought up and matured. And then the distal area, a small opening is left. At that time, 
any stool that is in the distal colon and rectum is irrigated out. And then we also leave the opening there, um, one, for any mucus to get out, but two, so we can do a colostogram prior to the definitive surgery um, so that we make sure we understand the anatomy. The only way to tell when there's no opening in the perineum, what type a male has is uh, to do a colostogram and see whether it's draining into the bladder or what area of the urethra. Looking now at the PSARP, um, so what Dr. Pena did is he realized that, you know, if you're having trouble finding or dissecting out the rectum, you really have great exposure that you can get from the posterior side. And so, um, you know, using an incision that often goes all the way from the coccyx down into the perineal body, you have, you know, great exposure to get a good dissection and make sure you safely get the rectum away from the urethra or the vagina. And then uh, here it's a little hard to tell. I think the sphincter complex is in this area, but um, the you know big goal of the surgery is to identify that sphincter complex. We use a stimulator um, and we look for a, a wink in the sphincter complex, both before we make an incision and then again after we make an incision. And you can see that in this next slide, you know, they show very clearly the sphincter complex, which is here, and you want to make sure and get that rectum right in the middle of this sphincter complex so that the child will have a chance of continence down the road. Um, as we discussed, you want to, you know, keep UTIs or stool getting into the urinary tract. So in this case, after the rectum has been identified, it's actually opened so that the urethral fistula can be identified. And then that urethral fistula is isolated and after you've dissected the rectum away from the urethra, that little diverticulum is oversewn and closed off so that um, there's no urinary leak. In this case, there was actually a bladder fistula. This is, usually the bladder fistulas are fairly small. This is actually one of the largest ones I have seen. Um, so, with high urethral lesions or with bladder neck lesions, we'll actually start laparoscopically. We'll identify the fistula and take it down from the abdomen and then flip the child over and do the rest of the dissection from, uh, from the bottom. And so here you can see the rectum posteriorly and the bladder Superiorly, you can see uh, the ureter on the right side there. So this one was actually so large that we used a stapler to cut across it. And then you can see it. There's the staple line on the bladder. Um, and now the rectum is completely free so we can pull it through the perineum. And then uh, finally, in rare cases, we need to make sure that the uh, uterus and the vagina can drain appropriately. And so in this case, uh, in a patient who had a cloaca and a very foreshortened vaginal canal, we actually create a neovagina with a piece of colon. So you can see. Um, this is normal colon and normal rectum that will be attached to the anal sphincter complex. This area of the sigmoid colon is cut on both ends 
and used to create the neovagina. And then this area of colon is attached back to the rectum in this lower picture, which I'll blow up here. <clears throat> so this is the neovagina, and this is the connection made between the colon and the rectum. Um, in these patients, if they have a normal uterus, normal ovaries, they can still get pregnant. Um, they oftentimes will need in vitro fertilization, and then they have to have an obligatory C-section because the colon will not accommodate um, a vaginal delivery. All right, switching finally to um, the prognosis long-term for these kids. So this is one of those you know, frustrating surgical diseases where you do a surgery up front and then you never know exactly how you did or how the kid's gonna do until you know, they get potty trained years later. So it's always difficult because you tell parents, well, you know, we think we did a good surgery, we're gonna hope for the best outcome, but you're really gonna have to tell me in two or three or four years um, how his continence, how his bowel control is. So there are some prognostic indicators that we can use. One is the type of fistula, lower fistula lesions, which include your perineal fistulas, your rectovestibular fistulas, and your rectobulbar fistulas. Uh, those patients tend to do better and tend to have better bowel control long-term. Patients with short channel cloacas, rectoprostatic fistulas or rectovaginal fistulas tend to do a little bit worse, and bladder neck fistulas or um, long channel cloacas tend to be uh, even worse than that and have a much lower chance of good bowel control. The spine, the spinal cord is also an important component. Um, Myelomeningocele's, you know, obviously separate from their ARM, are going to have worse bowel function, and in combination with an ARM, they have a significantly worse chance at normal continence. And then there is a um, sacral ratio, which I'll describe a little bit later, uh, that also comes into account. In addition, if they have abnormalities like a hemisacrum or sacral hemivertebrae or a presacral mass, those kids tend to do a little bit worse. So again, we come back um, you know, several times to this classification schema and what um, the incidence is. And we see that <clears throat> these green types, so these are the lower fistula types, um, both in males on the left and females on the right, with the exception of the rectovaginal fistula, uh, tend to do pretty well and have a good chance at continence and good bowel control. Um, the prostatic or short channel uh, cloacas tend to do a little bit worse, and then the bladder neck or long channel cloacas um, tend to struggle the most. Uh, the sacral ratio, very briefly, uh, we just take the top of the iliac crest to the um, lower part of the sacroiliac joint. And then that same joint down to the coccyx, the, that lower distance is divided by the upper distance and you get a ratio. And you want that ratio to be as high as possible. Um, so you really want a well-developed sacrum. Um, and if you're above 0.7, you know, that is a positive indicator. If you're less than 0.4, that is a negative indicator. Um, and so going back to prognosis by type, and these are all slightly altered depending on um, you know, the spinal issues or the sacral ratio issues, but you can see that in a lot of these lower lesions, you know, their ability to have voluntary bowel movements is pretty good. It's above 90% long-term. <clears throat> Once you get into 
you know, an imperforate anus without a fistula, a rectourethral or a rectobulbar fistula or a short um, channel cloaca, you know, those numbers start to drop a little bit. So 20 to 30 percent of those kids are having trouble with having voluntary bowel movements. But even amongst these patients that are able to have voluntary bowel movements, they are still not having perfect control. So, you know, 20 to 40 to, you know, in some cases, 50 to 60 percent of these kids are having some soiling. Um, and this is often, you know, at night and maybe not the, you know, the biggest um, inconvenience in the world, but certainly causes kids and families a lot of anxiety. Um, and so this is an issue that we often have to deal with. Um, other patients, you know, will report occasional fecal incontinence where they can't control it. Um, you know, this will often happen. Um, you know, they get a uh, gastroenteritis and have, a, you know, bowel movements that are a little more liquidy than normal. Um, but whereas most kids are able to, you know, make it to the bathroom before they stool themselves, these kids may not be. Um, and then, you know, it's one of those frustrating diseases where not only are they having fecal incontinence and soiling themselves, but they're also having constipation. Um, and, you know, you're kind of pulling your hair out because you're like, well, can it be one or the other? But many of these kids will have, you know, constipation, hard stools, you know, only stooling two or three times a week, and then also having episodes where um, they're getting incontinent or they're soiling themselves at night. Um, and then urinary incontinence is uh, generally very good, um, except obviously in the cloaca, we do a little bit worse. Um, now in our higher lesions, obviously we do a lot worse. Um, you know, the prostatic or rectovaginal, you know, now you're down to voluntary bowel movements only in two thirds to half. And then once you get to your bladder, neck fistulas or your long channel cloacas, um, you know, a lot of these kids are not able to have voluntary bowel movements. Soiling and, um, is a bigger issue. Constipation is an issue. And then urinary continence is a bigger issue as well. So one of the things that, you know, we tell patients up front before the surgery is that, you know, we can't promise perfect bowel function. In fact, you should expect some bowel difficulties, but um, what we can almost guarantee is that eventually we will get the kid to be functionally continent. Um, and that means, you know, they're able to go to school without stooling themselves. They're able to, um, you know, have a normal day without having to worry about their bowel issues, you know, causing them problems during the day in social situations, et cetera. And although you know, some of the things that we need to do to get these patients there seem onerous and very inconvenient, um, we can't eventually get them there. So there are bowel management programs where, you know, kids will undergo daily x-rays for a week, trying to figure out exactly, you know, the balance of getting them cleaned out um, with a big bowel movement in the morning and then getting them through their day at school. Um, sometimes in order to do that, we need a laxative maybe at night before they go to bed so that in the morning they wake up and are ready to completely evacuate. Sometimes they need anti-motility agents to slow them down a little bit. Um, we will often use enemas to get us to a place where, you know, we feel like we have good control of the bowel movements and their ability to evacuate everything. Um, and we used to uh, more frequently in cases that we were really having trouble um, we would consider a Malone anti-grade continence enema, and I'll talk very briefly about that. But really, the Peristine irrigation system um, has changed that for the most part, and we rarely need to do surgery on these kids anymore. Um, very briefly, the Peristine irrigation system is um, an enema where, you know, the only thing they've changed over normal enemas 
is after you insert um, the tube to instill the fluid, there's a balloon that blows up so that it helps the kids hold that liquid in their colon for longer um, so that they can really then evacuate it well. Um, for kids who, you know, have extreme troubles with this or kids who become, um, just have a lot of anxiety over anything being at their bottom, um, we do consider a MACE procedure where we create a valve um, at the cecum. We then bring the appendix up to the belly button so it gets hidden and you can't really see it. And then daily or every other day, they will cannulate that, irrigate the entire colon, evacuate themselves, and then um, can kind of take the catheter out and go about their day normally. So in summary, we talked about how the type of interrectal malformation determines the treatment and prognosis. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, surgeries, how they prevent bound obstruction and give our patients their best chance at continence. Um, and then at the end, you know, about how often these patients will struggle with bowel issues um, and need either somebody from the GI team or somebody from the surgery team or occasionally their primary care provider um, to really stick with them, set realistic expectations, um, help them understand that there is going to be some level of inconvenience, but uh, make sure and support them so that they can eventually get to a spot where, you know, despite a bathroom ritual once or twice a day, they are out in the community, you know, not worrying about their bowel movements and how it might embarrass them or cause them any issues. Um, I certainly need to thank the pediatric surgery group at University of Maryland and a couple of my mentors from Cincinnati Children's. Um, and then I've got some references here if anybody cares to look at them later.